Hello, I'm Brother Tyler, and my new companion is Brother Beard. Today on the Book of Mormon Scripture Challenge, I will give some predictions for the upcoming conference this October of the year of our Lord, 2020. I have a few predictions, the first of which is that General Conference this time around will have the overall focus on how you can know what is true. A lot of it will hinge off of Moroni's promise that we can search, ponder, and pray to know the truth. I hope that we will see talks focused on each of these three steps. To read the first step can entail listening, being taught, reading, and searching for things. Scriptures from the Old Testament, New Testament, books of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants instruct us to search the scriptures to prove God's word. We often forget about that important phase. To ponder, the second step can entail additional studies, thinking, recalling, discussing, hypothesizing, experimenting, or synthesizing. To pray seems to be the only step that counts for many of us, but answers can come during step one or step two. I know we will see lots of talks looking at the third step, as many tie how they hear him to prayer, but I will, I will be honest with you. Step one is where I hear him. Step two is where I review what I've heard, and step three is where I thank God that I hear him. My next prediction is that the first vision will be reinforced. For reference, let's review important steps taken in last conference, leading up to what they will do this conference. For months, we all were preparing for conference by studying the first vision account. I personally went to the church history museum with my family. I was pleased to discover a new section dedicated to the multiple accounts of the first vision. I have wanted the church to be more open about those since I discovered them back in 2014. There are many lost treasures in them that I felt were important for the church to discuss. I made several videos on these in my channel, focusing on those accounts in preparation for April's conference, and predicted that the church would have talked about those accounts. Unfortunately, I was wrong about that. The very first talk was Emerson Ballard's, who started off with the account of Joseph Smith's first vision. He introduced the scene, then said, we are blessed to have four primary accounts from which I will draw, and then began to use all four of Joseph's handwritten accounts combined to tell the story. It primarily used the 1838 account, which is in the Pearl of Great Price, but adds many details from the first account in 1832, and only a few phrases and adjustments from the other two accounts. I was thrilled at first because the 1832 account adds so many important thoughts to the first vision, but was disappointed that it seemed to be aimed to support what we know from the 1838 version, rather than embrace the full potential that the 1832 could add to it. There were no teachings of any other account after that. There was a great focus on the first vision as it is found in the Pearl of Great Price, especially giving the Hosanna shout to commemorate it and the new proclamation. The proclamation shows us how the leaders of the church will most likely approach this next general conference. When they wrote this declaration, they say, in humility, we declare in answer to his prayer, God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph. This declaration answers the largest question of struggling members of the church who look at the first vision accounts written by Joseph on the church website and ask this question. Was it Jesus alone? Was it angels proclaiming Christ and speaking for him? Or was it God the Father and the Son together? They declare that the way it happened was as Joseph recorded it his third time in 1838. Of the many questions many have asked, found in the Gospel Topic Essays on the church website, this one is being answered with a declaration that it happened the way it was canonized in the 1880s. Other topics, such as becoming like God and Heavenly Mother, confirming that all human beings are children of loving Heavenly Parents and possess seeds of divine within them. These declarations and talks show that the church will press forward, proclaiming the teachings of the church are correct and true as they are, and confusing things that they seem to contradict are not going to be discussed. 
I predict that the leaders of the church will continue to reinforce many of those most questioned doctrines, such as those in the Gospel Topic essays, with talks like Dallin H. Oaks talk this April, The Great Plan. They will stand on these answers firmly, though small adjustments may be made, such as M. Russell Ballard's talk, Shall We Not Go On In So Great A Call? in which he addressed parts of the 1832 and 35 accounts to the 1838, but in the end affirms that the theological points that you would find in the church's standard beliefs found in Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine from half a century ago. However, the teachings of Jesus Christ will continue to increase. The church has grown closer to Jesus Christ over the last three prophets, but mostly these last few years. If you don't believe it, look up conference talks from 50 years ago. Even the church changed its logo in 1995 to focus on Jesus Christ with a font change. That shows that the change started with Hinckley. Nearly a hundred years ago, in 1921, B. H. Roberts, a member of the 70 and a historical scholar, gave a two-day seminar teaching the church leaders about questions and difficulties about the Book of Mormon and the church. They had no answers for them at the time. His suggestions were to find and show the proof and to focus more on Jesus Christ. Proving something true is not faith alone, but study before prayer. Roberts concludes his study by encouraging them to focus on Jesus. And now, a hundred years after Roberts, the church created a logo with Christ's image. The emphasis on Jesus Christ will grow. That emphasis on our Savior will be evident in each session this conference this fall. I predict that more emphasis will be placed on temples and the necessity of their ordinances. These teachings, however, will not be supported by the Bible or Book of Mormon, but by modern prophets from Joseph until today. Every six months, many hours of well-crafted talks are presented to us, and most of us sit down, watch them, then walk away thinking, that was great, and forget about it, all of it for the next six months. Do we ever really think about what is taught? It is our job to prove them. Paul the Apostle praised the Bereans in Acts 17 for searching the scriptures to prove what he had taught to see if it was true. God commanded us to prove his word in Deuteronomy. In 2 Nephi of the Book of Mormon, we are told to use the Book of Mormon and Bible to disprove false doctrine. And the Doctrine and Covenants tells us that in them are all things written concerning the foundation of my church, my gospel, and my rock. Do you ever check? Do you ever try to prove what you hear from the pulpit to be true by searching the scriptures? Consider, my dear brothers, in Doctrine and Covenants 26, which the brethren of Colesville are told to search the scriptures to prove the church from that time until the next conference. If you are thinking that there is just too much modern revelation to prove what is taught, then you do not know the scriptures. When you open the Book of Mormon to the introduction, you see that it contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. I want to give you a challenge this coming conference. Put it to the test. Be like the Bereans and search the scriptures to prove the talks to be true. If it is true, it will grow like a seed. But if it is false, do not sit idly by and quietly do nothing about it. Talk about it with others. We should all be able to share topics between each other for reproof and approval. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Do not be afraid of it if it is wrong. Please start the conversation. Share your findings in the comment section below or with your family and friends. You may email me at brother3tyler at gmail.com. Do not fear man, but fear God. 
The gospel topic essays are written in response to questions that are being asked by members. Many of those issues were discussed by B.H. Roberts in 1921. Others, such as the Book of Abraham's translation, were recognized in 1967, when the original papyri were found. Though the leadership knew for decades about these things, none were answered until after the boom of the 21st century, enabling us, the members, to have access with the internet and to ask enough times to receive answers. Please recognize that we drive the change in the church. And if we do not question things, we will not progress and grow. God be with you in your studies. Until next time. I also predict two different talks will be given in this conference. A talk will be given emphasizing the teachings that fulfilling commandments brings remission for sins. And another talk will use Brad Wilcox's famous phrase, I need to do my best, but then Jesus does the rest.